<laughs> Professor Listry. Thank you, Leia. Welcome to the guests. We have many guests here from abroad, which is the reason why I'm introducing this in English. Uh, the film that you are about to see, The Big Touch, is a film which was released only on the 22nd of January 2003 in Paris. It has not been shown outside of France. This is obviously therefore the first screening in Israel to premiere. First of all, I'd like to say a few words about the director of this film, who I'm happy to say is with us here tonight and will participate in the discussions. He will also say a few words about this film after me. Jacques Tarnero is what uh, the French call an ancien 68 uh, He was actually a member of the Mouvement du 22 Mars, the 22nd of March, 1968, the same movement uh, with which Danny Le Rouge was associated and which ignited the students' revolt in France. He broke with that movement largely over its position on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He subsequently was active in the Acad Academic Association for Peace in the Middle East. And I think it would be fair to describe him as a militant, a militant de gauche, and his film comes from the left, but it's a sobering film and a critical film in many ways of certain <coughs> positions which have been adopted particularly uh, by the extreme left with regard to the Middle East. His own credentials in France with regard to the <coughs> struggle against the far right uh, are clear enough. He was actually the first time I met him, which was in the late 70s, I don't know if he remembers that, he, he was then uh, associated with the Centre de Recherche sur l'antisémitisme contemporain, which was rather close to the activities of the Vidal Sassoon Center for the Study of Antisemitism in Jerusalem. In the mid-1980s, he was chargé de mission. He was working with Laurent Fabius, who was uh, uh, then a very important uh, uh, person in the French government, in the struggle against the National Front. His first film, which was shown here in Israel, was called Autopsie d'un mensonge, The Autopsy of a Lie, which was a film about negationism or Holocaust <coughs> denial on the far left and the far right. But this film was made with Philippe and Susanne. And I'd like to say just a few words about how it comes to be shown at this particular moment in Israel. It actually all began uh, in September 2002 when I was on a visit to Paris and I called up Jacques Tarnero and we met and uh, we were talking about the situation of the Jews in France. And then he mentioned to me that he had a film which was nearly finished. And uh, he spoke to me briefly about the content. And I indicated I was very interested in seeing it. He took me straight away, almost straight away, to the studio, where I saw an earlier version of this film. And actually, I must say, I think, Jack, it would be fair to say that I convinced you to change the title because the original title was Enver Ram. I mean, there were a few mistakes in the spelling of Enver Ram, but I also thought it was a bad idea. And I think Decretage is an excellent title. So I'm glad that I played some small part in that. More importantly, with regard to the conference of which this is a part, the conference about anti-Semitism and, and prejudice in the contemporary media, it was obvious to me on that first viewing 
that this film was the perfect film for our conference and for the wider problem with which we have been wrestling and still are. <laughs> Namely, the ways in which the modern media reflect conflicts, the way they often distort, distort them, the problem of disinformation, the ways in which myths are created through their mass exposure by the media, and also the question that obviously most directly concerns Jack, which is the situation in France today. And this film is a reflection on that, on the situation of the Jews in France, but also more widely how we and our conflicts in Israel and Palestine are perceived and the, the distorting effects and the, uh, the representations and images which are generated. The film, I think, exposes some of the myths. It is a film which you could say is engagé, which is uh, a film that has a commitment to a point of view. But more importantly, I think that through its interviews, with different intellectuals, journalists, academicians in France, with certain personalities in Israel that played a critical role in the peace process. Um, it provides us with a unique opportunity to understand better the ways in which our everyday reality is filtered through <coughs> and uh, perceived in a country like France where its impact is particularly striking. So I think that you'll find that this, this is um, a special, a particularly and especially important film at this time. And the panel discussion afterwards, I'm sure, will raise many points. I'd like to uh, invite Jack Talneville to the stage and uh, let him say a few words. Bienvenue. Thank you. Um, thank you to be so many to, to see the movie. A few words. Uh, the film is now a big success in Paris. Um, and it's uh, strange also this success. And the success and the criticism of the movie in Paris could be produce a new movie about the criticism. <laughs> and we can follow this way very long. And, as this movie is not a film about the situation, but about the commentary of the situation. So I can do the commentary of the commentary to stay in the Jewish tradition. Well, we, I prefer we talk after the, you, you see the movie. If, and, uh, because in, in France, generally, it has been three kinds of critics. One was very corporatist. I don't know if, the, if, if it is the right word in English. Uh, how, who is he? How is it able to do this? He's not a journalist. Uh, uh, oh, go away, there is nothing to see. Um, second kind, ideological criticism. This is a Zionist, fascist, extremist, new right, and so on. Go on, there's nothing to see. The third one was mixed, or uh, also to, to tell us um, this is a Jewish movie for Jews, and they, they must stay in their boucherie cachère. It's much better than to look at this movie. And it has been also good cr critics, good criticism. People who try to understand the question which are in this movie. If I wanted to do a propaganda movie, ça n'aurait pas été cela. Je ne sais pas, je mets mal mon conditionnel. I, I should do another movie, a, a stupid movie. Ah, it's a very deep question for friends, but not only for friends. The starting point was how we were, we were disgusted two years ago when 
not only, it's not a, a movie about only the media. It's not an attack against journalists. It's much more deeper than this. Um, José Saramago, who Portuguese Prix Nobel de Literature, is not a journalist. And he said Ramallah is Auschwitz. José Bové, who is a cheesemaker in France, is not a journalist. Anyway, he is very important political people in France. And he said also a lot of uh, bullshit. So I, I, it's, this movie want to ask something. How is it possible that Israel is quite a fantasy, that a single fantasy in the world? Only one fantasy is Israel. So I wanted to, to, to investigate this passion, this obsession, that's all. Ce film n'est pas un documentaire prétendant à la neutralité. Il veut dire une opinion, il veut dire une indignation. Il dénonce cette grande régularité dans l'histoire des hommes qui a fait des juifs les boucs émissaires des malheurs du monde. Depuis 50 ans, la démonisation du juif a muté. To begin the, uh, the intellectual side of this evening, after that very powerful film I'm sure you agree, I'm simply, simply here to introduce the chairman and moderator who is Professor Gidon uh, Shimoni, who is the head of the Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University, and he will do all the honors and explain to you how we're going to proceed for the rest of the evening. Okay. I need hardly say that we are extremely grateful to Master Kamal for this initiative, this extraordinary film, and at the same time, the purpose of the panel, of course, is not uh, to have a review of the film or to discuss the film in itself, but rather uh, to address itself in the limited time that we have at our disposal to some of the central questions that arise both from the deliberations of the conference that's been taking place, and we're in the midst of that conference for those who are participants at the Hebrew University, and uh, the same questions really arise in this film, which could not be uh, more appropriate for the purposes of the conference on anti-Semitism and prejudice in media. What we will do is uh, have a panel discussion uh, conducted in the following way. I would ask the participants 
to speak for some 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, that will bring us to approximately um, 10.15. Uh, and if the circumstances permit, we will at that point uh, ask those who have to go to leave and those who wish to remain and participate in a brief discussion can please do so. And we'll have another opportunity to make a round in response perhaps to a few comments from the participants in the audience. Uh, I think we all realize that the hour is late and uh, therefore uh, we have to take into consideration that we cannot exhaust ourselves with this session. I need, however, to take a few moments in advance of the panel speaking to briefly present to you the panel. Uh, we have, uh, from uh, the closest to me, apart from the director, Met already in Jakarta. We have uh, Yitzhak Noy, who has worked at Israel Radio since 1965. Uh, he uh, earned a PhD in American history uh, from Brandeis University and has taught at that university as well as in Tel Aviv and at the Salem College of Arts. He's published nine novels in Hebrew, two of which were adopted into televised films. Uh, next to him we have um, Melanie Phillips, who has come from, uh, from Britain, is a columnist for the British Daily Mail, where she writes about social, cultural, and political trends. She's best known for her book about education, All Must Have Prizes, and she's also the author of The Ascent of Woman, A History of the Ideas Behind the Female Suffrage Movement, which will appear, I believe, shortly. In 1985, her play, Traitors, about British anti-Semitism was performed at the Drill Hall Theatre in London. Uh, Eliyahu Sanpedro was born in 1927 in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. He's a columnist and member of the editorial board of Haaretz. Uh, since starting his work with Haaretz in 1950, he has been its Jerusalem reporter, correspondent in Washington, diplomatic correspondent, and also occupied other positions. Uh, he has also written two books uh, uh, together with uh, uh, Yuval Elitzur and Sam Babli, respectively, Who Rules Israel and Fire Over uh, Beirut. Uh, Fiamma uh, Nierenstein, whom you will recognize actually from the first <laughs> that she would be a star this evening. She's a correspondent for La Stampa and Panorama, was born in Florence. She's an award-winning journalist, mainly for her coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and her analyses of terrorism, and the author of several best-selling books, uh, which one of which deals particularly with the current crisis in the Middle East and anti-Semitism. Uh, she also has... Um, uh, contributed columns to newspapers in the United States and to Italian television. And uh, finally, I think hardly needing any introduction, David Wittstum, who we see almost every evening on the Israel television, journalist and anchorman for Israel Television's Channel One. His past positions with Israel Television have included the European correspondent and foreign news editor, as well as the editor and anchorman of the foreign news program, Rohim Wolam. In addition, he's a commentator on foreign affairs for the Idiot Astronaut newspaper, and he also serves in a, as an adjunct uh, uh, lecturer in the History and Communications Department of the Hebrew University, as well as in the Political Science Department in Tel Aviv University. He's also directed documentary films and has published works on uh, uh, Germany, Europe, television, and so on. Well, as you see, we have here a very distinguished panel, and I'm only sorry that we have so little time at our disposal to hear them, because what we are asking them to uh, address themselves to uh, is very much the question of the media. Uh, they live and work in the media. One might say the media is their medium, and therefore it's particularly, I think, interesting and important to hear uh, their perspective <coughs> And I would like to try to focus the discussion, uh, although I know it's difficult to do so and to request this in a very short presentation, on uh, three major questions. 
Firstly, is there some kind of litmus test that would enable us to distinguish between uh, criticism of Israel, hostility of Israel on the one hand, and sheer anti-Semitism on the other? Perhaps one needn't spend too much time speaking on this question, because I think for most participants in the conference at any rate, uh, this has been discussed over and over again. But the second question is, given the forces, the, me the me mechanics, the processes, some deep, uh, some contingent, that we have seen demonstrated, particularly in this film, uh, is there a possibility of resisting this? Is this film, for example, an act of resistance, one might say? Can we hope to win the battle for fairness, for uh, defense against anti-Semitism? Or at most, can we hope to contain it? What are the ways and means at our disposal for doing this? I would like to ask the panelists as much as they can to address these issues, and then perhaps we will be able to focus the discussion better uh, than is possible in an completely open-ended discussion. I'd like to first of all call upon uh, Melanie Phillips. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'd like to start by congratulating Jacques Carnero most warmly for what I thought was a brilliant, devastating, and for a member of the press, absolutely shaming and absolutely true film. Uh, my only regret is that he's not able single-handedly to force every editor in Britain of newspapers and broadcasting media into a room, lock the door, and make them see his film. It would change a lot of um, attitudes, I think. Um, I've been asked to speak about the issues raised by the film in the context of Britain. Um, there are certain differences, quite obviously. Um, for a start, the whole Algerian perspective is obviously not shared by Britain. Britain tends to see the Middle East with a perspective of its own history um, in mandatory Palestine. But nevertheless, uh, the film for me was absolutely uh, resonant of the situation that I know in Britain because it uh, re recorded what I believe is happening in Britain, which is the way that the media connives at the dissemination of hatred and lies about Israel and Jews. Israel is represented by the British media in general through a prism of hatred. We have a kind of fast or anti-Israel and anti-Jewish feeling into which it morphs going on. So much so that a climate of extreme hostility, I believe, is now building up among the ordinary, decent, middle of the road, middle class, elderly, conservative, British, quite apart from everybody else. So much so that the Sun newspaper, which you may know of, is a famous tabloid, not known for its uh, moderation and uh, in the news presentation. And the Sun newspaper was moved by what it considered to be such a dangerous situation that was building in Britain to run a full page leader uh, which told its readers the Jewish faith is not an evil religion. Such as the state of affairs in Britain, the Sun has to produce such an editorial. Now, what's going on in the British media goes far beyond legitimate criticism of Israel. I believe we're talking about a wholesale moral inversion in which the very worst being automatically believed of people who normally tell the truth, while false claims made by those who are told demonstrable lies are reported as proven of fact, in which victims are treated as victimizers and vice versa, just as we saw in this film, in which respectable English people are now saying openly that they support the mass murder of Jews by Palestinians because these people are fighting for their freedom, and in which this hatred directed at Israel's Jews is being translated into a rising animosity towards Jews in Britain. Now, if one tries to talk about this and use the words the, the word anti-Semitism, one is it's made very clear that one is absolutely beyond the pale. One is not allowed to mention the term of anti-Semitism. And I've noticed this well before the interval. I've noticed this for many years in Britain. If you mention the word anti-Semitism, you immediately get a, a very hostile reaction from a very large number of people on the basis that here we are again, Jews are talking about needing special treatment. Who do these Jews think they are? They have no prerogative of suffering. Uh, Jewish protests of this kind shows that this is a kind of lobby uh, that comes uh, forward and which actually rules the world. And now, in the context of the Intifada, this critique 
has been slightly modified so that any Jew who now says the coverage of the Intifada and of Israel is uh, showing signs of morphing into anti-Semitism, we are told that we are sheltering behind this accusation of anti-Semitism, we are indeed sheltering behind the Holocaust in order to conceal the crimes against humanity that Israel is uh, carrying out in our name, because after all, no distinction is made between Israel and Jews. Now, I don't know whether you know about the English press, but the, the British press. Um, there are some newspapers which are pretty pro-Israel in general, um, the Sun I just mentioned, and the Daily Telegraph tends to be pretty pro, and the rest are pretty uh, not pro or extremely hostile. But even pro-Israel newspapers, such as the Telegraph, can't control the prejudices of its reporters. So even in such papers, the Telegraph, the Times, which as I say are pretty friendly with their editorials towards Israel, uh, Jamin was reported as a massacre um, in the way that it was reported elsewhere. Um, and uh, we also find, uh, quite apart from the press, the influence of broadcast media in Britain, which I think is extremely profound. Um, uh, the BBC, in my uh, limited experience of watching and being a participant on it, uh, is exceptionally hostile. Um, it uses a double standard when it interviews Israelis and when it interviews Palestinians. The questions directed at Palestinians are soft, there are no follow-ups, there is almost total ignorance on the part of the interviewer. When it comes to the Israelis, they get hostile questions in a hostile context. Um, dis discussions are set up uh, so that there is a kind of token person who is in favor of Israel, and, um, usually facing two or even three people who are against. Um, now, there is clearly a case for legitimate criticism of Israel. And this question of the litmus test, I think, is very important. And I think it is possible to have a kind of very rough litmus test. And I would suggest a few criteria. These are not exclusive. I can think of more, probably you could probably think of more. But these are a few criteria that I would suggest that can be used to see whether the criticism is changing from being legitimate to illegitimate. Are journalists using double standards against Israel by condemning its behavior while ignoring worse behavior by other countries? Are they expecting standards of behavior by Israel which simply would not be expected and could not be expected of any other country facing similar circumstances? Do they represent Israeli self-defense as revenge or punishment? Do they fabricate Israeli crimes against humanity? Do they deny Israel's rights to exist? Do they equate Israel with Nazi Germany or South Africa under apartheid? Do they single out or exaggerate Jewish power across the world or particularly in America? Do they claim that Jews denounce every criticism of Israel as anti-Semitism, when clearly Jews are uh, extremely uh, uh, disputatious about Israel? Do they use the visual images, the caricatures, and the tropes of ancient European and Nazi anti-Semitism? Do they display a quite obsessive and indeed hysterical preoccupation with Israel, ignoring far worse things elsewhere? And I would suggest the answer to all these things is yes. In Britain, in the British press, the British media, Israel's history is routinely denied or ignored, so that the defense against attack that has been forced to mount since its inception is falsely represented as aggression, and indeed that history is ignored. It is presented in the worst possible light by people who display an eagerness to believe that all its actions are malign, and even where the facts clearly refute such assumptions. The hysterical false claims by the British media and public figures of the Jenin massacre later proved not only to be false, but the opposite of what happened was an example. Perhaps even more worrying, worry, the evidence that radical Islamists are mounting a jihad against the West has been downplayed, ignored, or even denied. Instead, I would say a, quite a large proportion of British people, perhaps even the majority, are now certain that the cause of world terror is the unresolved problem of the Palestinians, for which they blame Israel. The grip exerted by this mindset was displayed at its most absurd, perhaps, after the bombing of Bali nightclub, even though this atrocity was perpetrated by a sect whose aim is demonstrably a pan Southeast Asia Islamist superstate. The independent newspaper and others nevertheless opined that the root cause of this was the Palestinian problem. And all this is being fueled by an unprecedented torrent of explicit anti Semitic propaganda pouring out of the Arab world, which itself is being ignored. Now, this morphs into explicitly anti-Jewish attacks. The language used constantly elides Israel and the Jews, and consciously or unconsciously, very often draws on ancient anti-Semitic tropes to do so, even in the most respectable media outlets. For example, the New Statesman, a left-wing magazine, but nevertheless very respectable, printed an investigation into the power of the Zionist lobby in Britain 
which it dubbed the Kershaw Conspiracy, and it illustrated it by a cover depicting the Star of David piercing the Union flag. After significant protests, but the protests were about the cover, not about the article, the editor apologised for the cover, but said he saw nothing wrong in running an article based on the premise that there was something untoward about Jewish influence. He defended himself by saying that the article came to the conclusion that the claims of Jewish influence were much exaggerated, but nevertheless, he thought it was a legitimate focus for inquiry by his magazine to find out whether Jewish influence was malign. Similarly, the Independent newspaper illustrated an article it ran on the Israel lobby in America with a picture of an American flag on which the stars were replaced by gold stars of David. And Prospect magazine, a very weighty intellectual uh, monthly publication, also published a large cover article asking whether the Israel lobby in America was distorting American interests and concluding that it did. Now, very briefly, why are journalists in Britain like this? There are many reasons. It's a complicated situation. It doesn't lend itself to quick analysis. I will run through the highlights. First of all, um, it, the journalists who are in the Middle East are governed by fear, and fear particularly of not having access to a story, quite apart from fear of being killed, perhaps. Uh, but fear of access to the story, fear of the wrath of their news editors, perhaps even outweighs the fear of being killed. And if their sources are Palestinian, um, then they are not going to gain say what the Palestinians are telling them. Secondly, uh, I know from this from past experience of working with the Guardian newspaper for many years, they are simply not interested in the misdeeds of the third world. They don't believe the third world is capable of misdeeds because the third world, by definition, are victims of the West. We expect the third world to behave like this. They have told me personally, we expect them to behave like savages. We cannot expect them to adhere to our standards of behavior, which is to respect human life. Therefore, we will not report them. And we will, if we do report them, we will not give them as much credibility, as, as, as much um, coverage as misdeeds by the West, for which we do you in Israel and you Jews the enormous favor, the enormous favor of considering that you are like us. So you should be pleased that we disproportionately report your outrages and don't report the massacres of many millions more Arabs by Arabs. Thank you very much. The next issue is the colonization of the media and other public uh, uh, institutions by the left. And I think this is actually an extremely significant point. Um, there is something about the new left which is particularly prone to this kind of attitude. The left has colonized uh, the media in general and intellectual life in general. And again, this is a complex matter, the reasons why the left takes these, takes these views. Uh, you could say, for, obviously, it's pretty, it is pretty obvious that the, uh, that the left believes that the West uh, is uh, imperialist, it demonizes America and Western capitalism, and lionizes the third world and all liberation movements. With the fall of communism, the left's major target issue has changed, as indeed we heard in the film. It's no longer economics of the fall of uh, communism, but instead of this to fill this vacuum left by the implosion of the economic theory, uh, Western notions of race, ethnic identity, and the nation state have become the focus. The very idea of dominant culture has been de uh, denounced as racist. Only multiculturalism is to be permitted as a legitimate basis for national identity in the West. Uh, monocultural identity is still, of course, the rigueur for all third world liberation movements. So, for the left, the very idea of a Jewish state is itself anathema. At a deeper level still, I think, the left's embrace of postmodernism and the whole business of victim culture has meant that it now tends to confuse truth and lies, right and wrong. And many a journalist I've heard on the left have said to me, there is no such thing as objectivity. When I've gone to them and said, you printed such and such, it is demonstrable lies, here are the facts. Bang, bang, here are dates, here are numbers, here are sources, here are demonstrable facts. I have seen it, I have heard it, I have seen I, I, I can give you the sources. Go and look for yourself. They say, no, 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 there is no such thing as objectivity. This is simply a matter of your opinion, because everything is simply a matter of opinion. So having signed up to this idea, and this is moral relativism by replacing truth with opinion, it promulgates the view that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. The resulting moral equivalence, which has now seeped from our intelligentsia in Britain into the general public, into these nice blue rinse ladies who live in, uh, in conservative constituencies. The result is that they all think that there is an equivalent between terror and its response. And that equivalence has quickly mutated into a moral inversion in which the suicide bomber becomes a hero while his victims had it coming to him. <coughs> now I have to tell you that I think that uh, this is a problem of uh, perception by the left which embraces Jews in Britain too. The British left would tend to very much disagree with everything that I have been saying. They will be among the first people to say to me, uh, you are sheltering behind this claim to avoid facing up to Sharon's crimes. And it's not just Jews in Britain, 
depends on the, uh, the underground in London one day, and I was recognized by a fellow journalist who I didn't have any met, she turned out to be an Israeli. I had not met her before in my life, in the, in the course of one tube stop, she said to me, I like what you write, with the one exception. I said, what's that? She said, it's what you write about Israel. I very rarely write about Israel, I write about domestic social policy. I said, what have I ever said that upsets you so much about Israel? She said, you present Israel basically as being uh, defending itself. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I do think that is the basic position. And she said, no, no, you're wrong. Israel is a Nazi state. Um, and she pulled out from her newspaper, uh, from her bag, a newspaper. I can't remember what it was. It may have been her RX. It may have been another newspaper. Uh, but she pulled it out and she said, look, unfortunately I don't read Hebrew. She said, look, in here you will find worse than you will ever find in the British press. In here you will find Israel called Nazi state. You will find Israel called the apartheid state. Um, you've got this completely wrong. Um, I don't know whether she's right or not about the Israeli press, and I don't read it that much, um, but that's what she said. What are we going to do about this, uh, finally? I can, I, again, only speak from the perspective of Britain, just two or three very short points. First of all, the Israel public, public relations uh, uh, um, in, in Britain is nothing short of absolutely catastrophic. Um, it is completely unproactive. It doesn't see what's coming, and when it comes, it responds in the most heavy-handed fashion. It doesn't say anything about uh, anti-Semitism in general. It doesn't say anything about Muslim anti-Semitism. It doesn't give those of us who try to defend it any weapons to use whatsoever. Everything we do is done in spite of the Israeli propaganda machine. Um, we have to go to places like memory, for which many thanks, it's transformed all our lives, but you know, why do we have to rely on memory? Why is it the Israel government producing this kind of thing? Secondly, there's a total vacuum in Jewish leadership in Britain. People like to keep their heads down if they believe what I'm saying. They agree with what I'm saying, they're too frightened to say it. Many of them don't agree with what I'm saying, because for them, Sharon is the arch enemy. And one has to be a psychologist, I think, to ask why there is this demonization of Sharon in the British Jewish community. I would say it's because they have to demonize Sharon because not to do so is to face up to a reality which is too terrible, too terrible, which is that there is no easy solution. Um, and that, you know, it's not the case that if Israel gives up the territories tomorrow, there will be peace. That's my personal view. And I think that's why it's so important for people on the Jewish left to demonize Sharon. And the third and final point I can make is that what's most important is that material like this becomes shown, which is why I do so very much hope that this film is made by a British person who takes this example to heart and does the same thing in Britain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, luckily for you, the things that I have to say are shrinking dramatically. <laughs> because I've said before something in the movie, because the movie is uh, wonderful and tells a lot of things and I don't need to repeat it, because what Melanie says also about the points that uh, form the litmus, uh, as you, how did you call it, <laughs> test, I completely agree with them. So I will try to alarm you a little more and uh, to give you some more point of uh, reflection about this new anti-Semitism. If I can start from the last point, okay. the question, if, uh, uh, if there is a possibility that we can really fight against it, my answer is quite doubtful. I think that in the next future, we will see a, a worsening of the situation because of the coming war with Iraq. Uh, the, uh, the, the equation that you see in the European mind now is that because Israel is an avant-garde of the American uh, uh, power in the Middle East and because all of the troubles that are born toward the West sprang from uh, the Jewish presence, the Israeli presence in the area, uh, the, the fault of the wars, uh, and the fault that the movement of the so-called pacifists, which I would have many things to say about this, this attribute, but uh, attribute to Israel will grow and grow, and, uh, and uh, the Jewish in Europe will find themselves in trouble even more than they are today about the troubles and how much they come out from, from the information. The troubles are terrible, 
You don't have to delude yourself that this kind of anti-Semitism that you are in front today is a marginal phenomenon, something small. Durban gave the start, I was there, uh, and I was astonished then. I remember the same astonishment when the peace process collapsed. I was here when the peace process collapsed, and Arafat came back with the V, and you pointed out very well that this V was really the sign of whatever was going to go on since since then on, and when I have been in Durban, I have witnessed uh, with horror something that was going to spread all over the world and to be diffused, and, uh, and that uh, today is widely spread, mostly among, uh, uh, not only in the little bourgeoisie and in the people or the common reader of the newspaper, but also among uh, professors in the university, uh, strong movements of intellectuals and, and of course a journalist. I, I, why do I mention that? Just to underline how important is the role of information because it's not only about uh, 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 people that resents of the millennial uh, anti-Semitism that Europe has been suffering with only with very short, very very short uh, as I call, interventions, interruptions. So the last 50 years are really an exception in the history of Europe. Usually, anti-Semitism is, is there. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this intellectual anti-Semitism just to point out how important is information. These people that are today anti-Semite, they are very well informed people people that can quote to you lots of sources, lots of newspapers uh, uh, giving uh, the same uh, uh, version of uh, Janine, for instance, of giving the same version of the story of Bethlehem. And here you have a very uh, clear litmus case uh, in Bethlehem. You see, the reality in Bethlehem was not very difficult to decipherate. You have, uh, uh, after uh, a series uh, of terrorist attack coming just from that area and a lot of, uh, of uh, shooting in the direction of Gilo coming from a well-defined group. You have uh, the invasion by armed people of a church and then you have the surrounding of the church by the Israeli army. You can blame the surrounding of a church by the Israeli army but you cannot uh, uh, exempt yourself if you are a journalist by saying repeatedly, because a church is in question, that the people inside the church are armed. This is something that all along the millennia that I'm talking about, the church never allowed to anybody. In this case, I think this is the first time in the history of the church when the armed, a, a big group, hundreds of armed, armed people have been allowed to stay armed inside the church, which receiving orders that this was also commonly known by us, the journalists were standing outside in front of the church, uh, receiving orders from Arafat, from a central point that was telling them when they had to go out, when they had to come in, when they had to exchange uh, people, when they had to send somebody sick to the hospital, when they had to denounce that they did not have food, which by the way did not result to it. So there, the stereotype that was made of the story, echo. this is the latest point. I mean, when you define this, uh, um, this uh, uh, siege in a stereotyped way, uh, taking out of the closet a lot of uh, uh, remembrance of uh, the, 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 the Jewish killing uh, the, the the children in Bethlehem, because this has happened, you know, and you know very well to what it refers, and uh, to uh, and to show more and more kind of a persecution by the Jews to the Christians in the place where Christianity has been born. Well, this is such a clear, uh, this is such such a, such a clear application of whatever should not be there as far as information is concerned. When you speak about uh, uh, 
the mistakes or the nervousness or the, or the problem uh, of an army uh, that is standing in front of a church for so many days and that creates lots of problems to the civil population, even around. Well, this is criticism. All the rest is not criticism. All the rest is bullshit and uh, is, uh, is, uh, is part uh, of uh, what made the anti-Semitism that is now around come out. Um, all that has been said about uh, um, the several uh, uh, policies of double standards, uh, despised to the, uh, for the Arab people, uh, uh, in uh, different uh, way of approaching the problem of terrorism, giving more thought to the one chasing for terrorists than to the terrorists themselves. I completely agree, and I don't want to come back to it. I will only finish. I suppose I'm at the end of my time. Right? So I will only be, uh, finish offering a, a couple of thoughts that could be worth thinking about, about you, this new anti-Semitism. Um, this kind of uh, new anti-Semitism reminds much more the theological anti-Semitism than the Nazi anti-Semitism. Why? Because you can renounce, you can convert. You can convert, you can become a good Jew, you can hate Sharon, you can put yourself on the side of the good Jews, sign a, 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 a petitions uh, as uh, several Jews are doing uh, right now all over the world. So you can convert, you can easily do that, even e more easier, even easier than, uh, than in the past. Then there is another point which is very important. You are not allowed to denounce anti-Semitism if you are a Jew. This is something oh. also very interesting. If you do that, this means that you are a, a simply a rightist, that, you are, that, that you, you are denouncing something that only plays in the hands of Sharon. So you are not allowed to denounce your anti-Semitism. When, when, you, when you say something about you are immediately singled out as a, as a rightist. And even, uh, even more than that, very interesting and make the things very, 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 very hard to fight. Uh, in this anti-Semitism is an anti-Semitism of people that declare themselves uh, uh, the, the most fierce fighters against anti-Semitism. They are the real defender of the Jewish soul. They are the real defender of what the Jew should be. And, uh, and this is something uh, completely new, because in the past, anti-Semitism movement had at least uh, the courage to define themselves as anti-Semites. You find a lot of anti-Semite writers, a lot of anti-Semite uh, uh, manifests, uh, uh, and a lot of anti-Semite uh, uh, movements. You don't find them now. You will find everybody denying these anti-Semitism. So, to answer to your, yes, so, uh, the, to, to answer to your last question, will it be possible well, it will be possible to fight, as Zach does, as Melanie surely does, as I myself have tried to do that. It will be very, very hard all, all to, 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 to win. Because the media today, for all the reasons that have been told here, are now nourishing this anti-Semitism. But the anti-Semitism is there. It's not, it, it is not born by the media, is fed by the, by the media, is helped by the media, but it's not a media product. Anti-Semitism is mostly a European uh, theological uh, uh, creature, and the creature is today coming up as ugly as always. I think it's um, really difficult to uh, go sort of against the current after such an uh, impressive, uh, impressive film and presentation. 
uh, and of course uh, also Vincent Karin, um, and uh, I'm not going to uh, defend all these people that we've seen on the screens here and so on, but I would like also a, a, little, a, little, a little bit to talk um, about something that also Mary Phillips has already uh, mentioned, and uh, I see here and read um, uh, every day um, around me in my own television station and in the Israeli media. Now, if we compare the French media to the Israeli media that you have presented, what would we get? And uh, I suspect that the, that the woman you met on Saturday um, was extremely right. I think she was very right. I mean, yes, I think would concur with what I'm saying because there is nothing that I've seen here uh, that I haven't heard and seen on, this, on the Israeli media. And if the French media goes to Nikmus test and uh, is presented as anti-Semitic, we must say that also the Israeli press is anti-Semitic. And uh, this is, uh, in, order to, uh, in a way, perhaps could be uh, seen as a bold accusation. But I think it is not actually anti-Semitic in the sense that we are talking about European anti-Semitism, its roots, um, its uh, social functions, uh, its social origins, theological and others, but it is a sign of the ongoing discussion, conflict, dialogue, on many levels that is going on in Israel. And now imagine, you know, a correspondent coming to Israel, having Israeli press read to him, translated to him, looking at the cartoons, Looking, uh, looking, for example, how our MPs in the Knesset talk to each other. I mean, you know, uh, I've heard almost, I think, not almost, every day, uh, 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 analogies with Nazi, with, with Nazi regime about almost anything, about any subject in Israel. I mean, it's become so cheap, you know, this kind of, of, of analogy, that, I mean, it is not a anything that may makes us move anymore. Of course, it does impress us a little bit when it is done, let's say, in Germany, or even in France, during the, the past. But still, it is not anything that we are not accustomed to, but not know about, we do know about. What is, I think, wrong is that this ongoing discussion, this, I think, um, dialogue, this opposition uh, in Israel, this is not portrayed enough on European media, and, your, and I think that what is, I think, more, more um, lacking in the European, I think more European than American media, I think surprisingly, is a kind of lack of ability or a sort of laziness, yes, in searching the story, going the story, and going, as you say, and you did in your film, going against the current. Now, uh, I think that when I, when I particularly look at television, but I think newspapers are in a way the same, although they follow television in their coverage, especially of conflict area, I think that what I would say uh, is, that, is the problem, is the deepest problem here, is the move that media, communications, uh, newspapers and, uh, and uh, television and radio, from the establishment, from opinionated establishment to the uh, private sector. Now moving to the private sector has, has had a very strange effect on, let's say, Israel television and the audience here looks at uh, our competitors. I'm working on the public television, but uh, my, comp my competitor is second, uh, the, the second channel, or Yediot Achronot, or Mari, or, or now Channel 10. What has happened to them? Have they become yellower? Have they become cheaper? Have they become, do we see more sex on, uh, on Channel 2? Do we see more gambling? Do we see more, uh, more pornography, whatever? Or more crime? No, we see more state. We see the, uh, the kind of, um, of um, uh, 
a new philosophy to, to make themselves even more uh, state-like than our state television. They interview more politicians. They, they, they carry out live all their, all their speeches by George Bush and by Clark and whatever. They, uh, the, the headlines every day on the newspaper are not headlines of, of the crime scene or the sex scene, yes, but uh, as in England, for example, or in Germany, but the headlines are what Sharon has been saying, because they would like to kind of uh, claim for themselves this kind of thing that we, that we thought is going to, to be privatized. So this is a very, perhaps, paradoxical effect that happened to the press, but still, on the other hand, they look much more so to what the, what, what the audience demands. And what the audience <coughs> demands is not, and I'm, and I'm hardly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen actual examples of anti-Semitism in the media itself in your film. Am I wrong? I think that, I think that what we have seen are anti-Semitic um, incidents in the Arab world on demonstrations we were talking about the NGOs, which I think are very, uh, very, very anticipated. Uh, and uh, we are seeing it in some of the newspapers uh, and so on and so forth, mainly in the cartoons, opinions, and so on and so forth. We are not seeing it, let's say, on prime time television. We're not seeing it in the main commentary. This is still is not PC, it's not politically correct in Europe, because public television and also private television main private television in Europe is still copying the public television old standards or it doesn't copy it, but it does as if it is copying it, playing much more in, in a way of a theater, presenting as a theater than doing, uh, the, than doing real news. I think this is, and this is one of the, one of the melodies, the privatization of all television, of all channels, that, that make this melody. Now we present the old values, but we're not really presenting them. In the name of so-called, what you've called moral relativism, yes, we actually look as if we are presenting them. While on the other hand, we are kind of winking to the audience, winking to the ratings, and having more and more disregard for what the story is, what research is, uh, and, and this kind of laziness, this is, uh, uh, and, and of course we, we keep an eye what is, what is our uh, competitor doing, not what we should uh, be doing. I think these are the main points that I would uh, like to make here, so not to be uh, too long, I'll give the microphone to someone. the risk of being the devil and saying, okay, I would like to, to put the whole question a little bit in perspective. First of all, all, all news, and there is an American saying, that all news are ultimately local. For Israel, all lo news, are for, local news are foreign. Everything that happens in Israel, be it the fact that the that the mayor of Jerusalem is an, is an orthodox, or that something happened in a school in Ramat Gan, is international news. We may like it or we may dislike it. I, I, I take the risk of saying that we have to remember that this concentration on Israel is, a, is actually a, a continuation of the protocols of Zion, which in the long run sometimes work in our, in our benefit. It's not only at the benefit of anti-Semites. When many countries believe and believe that Israel is much stronger than it really is, that it has more allies in the world than it has, it is part of this problem. And it is related to the fact that everything that happens in Israel gets automatically magnified abroad. I, I bring every evening, I sit about two hours at the internet and look for Jewish news. That's my bare week in And I must tell you 
that there are uh, perhaps 25 or 35 times more Jews, Jewish news than other news on the, on the internet. People are interested about Israel, people are interested about Jews. The second point I would like to make that not all the world is anti-Semitic. We are perhaps rightly frightened by, uh, by evidences of anti-Semitism, but that's not the whole picture. I maintain that even today, in year 2003, Jews have it better than ever had in the history since the Second Temple. Jews are the elite in most countries, and you have to pay a certain price for being elite. Nobody likes the elites. It is, I don't think that Israel could have gotten all the support it got if Israel would not be something special. Uh, I think that, uh, contrary to what was indicated here, I do think that anti-Semitism comes in waves. We are now at the crest of an anti-Semitic vogue, or what we think is anti-Semitic vogue in Europe. I think it's more of a manifestation than a substance. Uh, it's a, I think that the world has the right to expect from Jews more than it expects from Ghanaians or Canadians or French. We claim to be the, the, the people of the book, we claim to be the people of the prophets. We, we, exist, we exist on the basis of that claim. They have a right to expect us to behave. Like the, like the people of the book, like the people who gave morality to the whole world. That, that, that is our, that is our uh, shield. That is our even... Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that if they ask us who were 2,000 years persecuted and were the minority to be some better and to be more considerate of minorities than the Goyim are, I think they have a, we have a duty to be better than the Goyim. Now, the question was, can I say another point? I think uh, we are also uh, um, suffering from the fact that the world got fed up with the story of the Holocaust. We might find it tragic and unbelievable, but people of the world got you know, have enough of it after 50 years. I am a survivor of the Holocaust. I, can't, I shouldn't understand it perhaps, but people are, have enough of it and we have a share in it. Because if you look at the news about the Holocaust in the past 15 years, it is 90% about the material claims and 10% of the moral claims. Everybody speaks in my name about the Holocaust. Israeli governments are speaking in politics in my name, in the name of the, of the 6 million who were killed. Nobody authorized them to do that. And the question was, uh, what, what are the litmus tests of an open differentiate anti-Israelism from anti-Semitism? I think we can put together a very specific list uh, going from less to more. To more. I think when uh, if somebody starts speaking about Israelis instead of Israel in the negative sense, that is the beginning. Because that is getting close to, the, to the defining Israel and Jews as the similar. The second point is, when they begin to question the right of Israel to exist, implicitly even, because that is getting very close to the point that was mentioned here several times, that uh, the Jewish people doesn't have to, uh, uh, the right to a state like every other people has. The next thing is, when they begin to use epithets 
without identifying with anti-Semitism. Like if people greedy, if people uh, uh, treacherous, if people perfidious, these are the evidence and descriptions that are having already anti-Semitic connotations uh, because of, partly because of the Bible, but also because of the Quran. Uh, then the next point is in the caricatures. Many of the caricatures, and I'm, tomorrow we'll hear from Julia Ritzur specifically asking about the subject. Then they begin to, to depict the Israeli as a typical Jew, they are very ghetto, close or even passing that litmus test to around the wrong side. Uh, when, when Sharon is, uh, is, is depicted as a, a, an ogre eating a, a bleeding child, that is already identification with the, the, the blood libel. Uh, the next point is when they use uh, the Magenta Vigadon, the Star of David, as an identification of Israel. Because the, the, the Star of David has more identification with Judaism than with Israel. Uh, the la next before last uh, test is when uh, they put, uh, use outright Christian uh, term anti-Semitic terminology. Like, the blood libel, the references, and the Christ killers, and similar. And of course, the, the ultimate is when they uh, denounce the Jews for things that Israel does or does not do. That is, of course, the ultimate passion. Uh, what can we, uh, then does anti-Israelism become anti-Semitism? I think we have must realize that this is not a black and white question. There is no outright, only, there are not only 100% anti-Semites and Nazis and 100% righteous people. There are a wide uh, line of, uh, of graduation. Instead of looking for how should how should we co uh, uh, counter the outright Nazis and anti-Semites, we should concentrate on how we prevent or, or limit this graduation from people who are do not like Jews. How should we not become outright anti-Semites from people who are friendly to Jews? How should, how can we prevent them to become neutral? Uh, in this uh, the question of anti-Semitism. Uh, in this connection, it is very important uh, that we should not have this identification of uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel. I think it's very, very dangerous when we describe every expression, anti-Israel expression, specifically anti-Israel government expression, as anti-Semitism, because we have those who want to identify between the two things, between anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism. We should, we should help separate the two things, even we as Israelis. Uh, also, uh, I think that uh, when, when we, when I mentioned earlier that in Israel all domestic news are foreign news, we have to face the question that we have to continue, this is a fact, and we have to ask ourselves the question, are we not, are, do we as, as Israelis not have the right, as every other nation, to criticize our government and to oppose certain actions by the government just because some anti semites may use it? I think we have the right to conduct our domestic policy as every other nation has the right to do it. Well, being the last one talking here, oh, we have the rector. Yes. Uh, 
I tend to agree with the uh, school. We are not about criticism. It should be mentioned now that the, uh, in the very beginning of the uh, of uh, the things I have to say here. We are not about criticism. Uh, we are amidst a war, a vicious war, and uh, we make mistakes. And uh, much of the criticism that is written in the Western press uh, concerning Israel is justified. Not all of them, of course. Unlike Dunavistu, I uh, succeeded vividly in uh, seeing the, uh, the subtle anti-Semitism in your movie, which you, I understand, failed to see. Uh, Maybe here is the point to, to, to mention that maybe Dudo and I are the only ones uh, who were born in this country whose upbringing was Israeli. And it is a very important distinction because we were brought up in, as members of a majority society, as members of the majority. And our psychological upbringing make us by definition, almost, insensitive, in relative terms, to anti-Semitism. Having said that, and being a, a, uh, a diligent follower of the Western press for the last um, 15, 20 years, maybe because of my work at the radio station, I have to tell you that uh, sometimes I have a strange feeling and I say to myself, beyond your uh, Israeli insensitivity, there is a very strange aura or a very strange feeling that I'm picking up that I don't know how to deal with. I'll give you an example a little bit later. I'm, I'm even willing to accept what you, Mr. Salter, said before, that we have to go beyond that. It's none of my business that a group of Dutch soldiers in Kosovo, headed by, by an officer, let hundreds of, of, of defenseless uh, Bosnians being butchered by the Serbs. And the investigation committee, if there was such, I'm not sure even about that, was a very quiet one. It's none of my business. I have to demonstrate much higher standards. I agree. Having said that, still I have this uncomfortable feeling that is growing about that subtle anti-Semitism. I'm not afraid of the overt anti-Semitism. I'm not afraid, I'm terrified, but not afraid of the Muslim anti-Semitism in Europe. Because it's obvious, and you can see it, and you have the means to deal with it. I'm terrified, I'm petrified, by the subtle anti-Semitism that is being demonstrated very gently in publications such as The Economist. Now, The Economist will never print the protocols of the uh, elders of Zion. Never, ever. If it does, it will give the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, exact explanation and introduction and uh, make the right, uh, the right corrections and, and everything that fit for an intelligent person to read and know that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is, is, a, uh, is a fabrication that has no basis, despite the fact that it's been, it, is, it has been so successful uh, for about, uh, what, 100 years or more now. But when the economist writes a story about the king of the junk bones, Michael Milken. And he tells us his story and how he, uh, he was uh, penalized by, by, the, uh, by the stock market board and uh, for about what, $900 million or something like that, which he uh, cheerfully paid in order to avoid jail, which didn't help him much. Anyway. Uh, God forbid they won't write the title, uh, A Bloody Jew Makes Money and Being Penalized. But the title is uh, Land of Milk and Money. And then I have to ask myself, well, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with me. English 
as you can well hear, is not my mother tongue. And uh, my feeling for the language is, is an external one. Now, maybe there is something about the uh, British or the English famous sense of humor that I miss. Still, I feel uncomfortable. I can't see a serious American publication uh, such as the uh, US News and World Report, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, of course, New York Times, that would dare come up with such a title, Land of Milk and Money, to, uh, to, to, to make sure to those uh, in the audience uh, who are not familiar with the uh, trick based on Land of Milk and Honey, okay? That's Zabat Halabudvash, Land of Milk and Michael Milk and Money. I don't know what to make out of it. I, 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 I have, I'm, I'm more comfortable. You find it funny. So th there are some differences between us. You see, you work for the Israeli TV. And uh, you talk about anti-Semitism. And I wanted to tell you that there is no anti-Semitism on, on, on Israeli TV. There's simply pet TV, that's all. <laughs> But you see, I, I, I happen to have here, happen to have, I brought it all the way from Tel Aviv, the latest edition of the Sunday Telegraph. And uh, I, I really have no look here. They, they are giving justifiably so, justifiably so, a, a photograph, a picture of the demonstration, a big demonstration in London against the war on Iraq. Uh, when you examine it from up close, if you hold it for me for a second, please do me a favor. And then you look at the Jewish Chronicle, the latest edition of the Jewish Chronicle, that, uh, that complains about... I need my glasses, you see. I've got some work for you. You hold it. Okay. So they are complaining under whose banner? Under whose banner? Now, when you check it, when you look at it closely, you find out that most of the placards are against the war on Iraq, but not all of them. Most of them are being printed by a group that is called MAB, being Muslim Association of Britain. And many of them, when you look there, can you see it? Yeah, have, instead of Iraq, they have, uh, for instance, Palestine, exactly, free Palestine. They don't tell you which Palestine they are talking to, uh, talking about, I mean, uh, Bethlehem or Tel Aviv or whatever. But, but when you examine it, you see that much of it involves Palestine. What, now, what the heck, excuse the expression, between the war in Iraq and Palestine? What is the connection? Now, the thing that frightens me is that the readers, the readers get the message even subconsciously, and I'm not blaming the reporter. Oh, you, you, you counted them. Okay, let me see. We have the same photograph. Uh, no, I don't think there are two Palestines. There are many, many more Palestines there. Do do. Do do. Ah, three. Why don't you continue to count? This argument after How, many? About out of time. How many did you count? No, I say I suggest we settle the argument on our own time afterwards. Okay, fine, fine. But but the point is uh, understood, I believe, and I have a problem with it because it makes an impact. It's a gradual impact, maybe, but in the subconscious, the connection between the war in Iraq and Palestine, or freedom for Palestine, is being made. Now, 100 years ago, a proto-Zionist named Leif Pinsker wrote the auto-emancipation. We won't get into it, except to say that uh, he was a physician. And he coined a term that is called eudophobia. Eudophobia, uh, he, uh, he used to describe a social sickness that Europe suffers from, uh, a sickness that he believed Europe is 
or was incapable of curing itself. And uh, I think the, the, that sickness, the xenophobia, is still with us, even though uh, it is uh, totally different. It has different sources and uh, different techniques, and it's, it is, in Western Europe especially, it is much more subtle than it used to be during the, uh, or towards the, uh, the uh, fourth quarter of the 19th century, or the early 20th century. It is different today because it draws from two different sources. One is the uh, liberal left that criticizes Israel, and uh, like I said, has every right to do so. But, but some of the criticism is not exactly fair, as we saw in the, in the movie, being in, in France or England or, or Belgium or wherever. And uh, that criticism, together with the uh, latest division between Europe, especially Germany and France, and the United States, helps direct much of the intellectual animosity towards Jews. Through Israel, through the United States, subconsciously, but animosity, nevertheless, that that uh, I, I don't want to use the word picks up momentum, but but develops gradually. The other source is the uh, is the fact that that uh, if you take a country such as France, close to 11 percent of its population is Muslim today. And uh, it is very influential. And politicians in France have to take it into account. And uh, even L'Express International, uh, I believe a month or two ago, published a caricature showing a synagogue that is uh, being set on fire, up in flames. Across the street, there is a gendarmerie, a police station, or whatever, and the policemen see the synagogue on fire through the window, but they watch the television that shows riots in the Middle East. And it was L'Express International. We, what's that? No, no, no. This is not anti-Semitic on the contrary. But what it tries to say is that even from the point of view of a non-Jewish publication such as L'Express International, there is a problem. Now, we had a documentary uh, two or three months ago, and uh, on the line we had Roger Kukerman, who, who is one of the leaders of the, uh, of the uh, Jewish community in France. And uh, he spoke Hebrew, he speaks beautiful Hebrew, and he said to us, following the, uh, the declaration of, the, of uh, Shimon Peres and Jacques Chirac at the time that there, uh, there was, there is no anti-Semitism in France, he said, nonsense. He said that anti-Semitism is there. Most of the attacks against the Jews come from Muslims. That's true. But more and more you can see attacks coming from the extreme right, Christian right, that is cooperating with extreme groups within the Muslim community. And the authorities how shall we put it, are not, not very enthusiastic about acting because of the political impact of the Muslim community in France. Uh, in Britain the situation is, is a little bit better, but I'm not sure uh, how long this will last. This is a problem. Now, we tend to, to, to believe, we Israelis, I, I suppose, that since since more and more Europeans realize that the Muslim communities in their midst uh, are becoming a problem, a social problem and a political problem, and take, for example, in Belgium and now in the demand that is coming from certain circles of the uh, extreme fundamentalist uh, uh, Muslim in Belgium and other places to, to uh, establish some, some form of of Muslim sovereignty within Europe, that they get more and more frightened from the Muslims in Europe. And, and that is a good reason for them to appreciate the Jews or appreciate Israel and to realize 
uh, to realize that, that uh, the three are maybe the, uh, their friends. But this is not the case at all, because the human the spirit of the human heart is broad enough uh, to hate both the Jews and the Muslims. And if you ask me, I believe that there is a paradoxical phenomenon that is developing now, that the more the Christian Europeans, and I'm using the word Christian because uh, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing recently talked about Christian civilization that should prevent the entry of Turkey into the European Union. It's not my expression, it's his expression. Now, the more Christian Europe will face the Muslim community within Europe and, and see it as a threat, I think the animosity towards Jews within Europe will grow in parallel lines. This, this is my belief. I, I, uh, why? Because, because of the identification. Because they'll see the uh, Israelis, no, not the Israelis, but the Jews within Europe as a part of the broader Semitic problem. And uh, photographs or pictures like this should contribute to this growing phenomenon. This is what I think. And now I'd like to ask Jack O'Shaw. I've noticed that you're reacting to uh, some of the comments that have been made, and it must be frustrating that I'm going to say to you, of course, this is just a brief opportunity, but please, we'd like to hear some of your comments. My first comment in the Jewish debate is um, to, to understand that it's not possible to speak shortly, but uh, everyone must make a big, big, big uh, speech. I said the first, the first remark, because it's for, it's for big, the debate. So I want, I think that the debate about antisemitism or not antisemitism is, is not a good word. The problem is not, maybe there are, very clearly anti-Semitic anti -Semitic words. The problem is not this one. The problem is, is it true or is it not true? But I ask you to do. When the journalist in 82 said, now with the Lebanese war, the Israeli army is uh, uh, beginning the final solution of the Palestinian question. Is it anti-Semitic or not? So, you say, it's wait, stupid, but not only stupid. Okay, okay, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish, please. So, the, when about, please, when there is in Arte, which is a very sophisticated media, a big, um, reportage, story about Jenin. And you have one doctor with one journalist, British people. And the journalist asks it, it during one hour, when is the proof of the massacre? And the doctor says, I can't find them. So where are the proof? I can't find them. So, ah, you can't find them. So the proof has been dissimulated. Uh, so the known proof is the proof that it has been a massacre. You see, this is not uh, anti-Semitic. This is mental madness. I don't know. Uh, and it happens so many times, but not only about Israel. Not only about Israel. So the question is, what is this strange job, journalist, which consider itself nobody can criticize it. The fourth power is television. Uh, television, much more than the newspaper, uh, especially in France. You have the intellectual debate, political debate, is so low now in France. So stupid. 
So we have the television, maybe we can't do better than this. The problem is not only antisemitism or not. It's what is the intellectual target the media want to set up. Um, I do not agree, and I agree with you, that any criticism of Israeli politics is anti-Semitic. And you are uh, in Israel, vous ne vous en privez pas. Uh, uh, <laughs> the criticism about Israeli politics is very, very important and so on. And I am happy to, to, to look at this. But um, I, I think the real problem about the media, but not only the media, is the symbolic status of Israel. Why my, my deeper question is, why this obsession? Why the, and I think the, the explanation is, it's a perversion. We, we are in the Western countries now with, without uh, any goals and the, the European building make collapse borders, the idea of nation, the idea of culture. Um, and we don't know what we want to be in Europe. And when uh, Giscard d'Estaing refused the entrance of Turkey in Europe, I think it's a very clever question. And the media, but not only the media, refuse to think is what is this symbolic status? And I think if so many attacks against Israel, it's not attacks against the real Israel, but the symbolic function of Israel in the mind, in the state of mind. And I think the attack is against what Israel symbolized um, au-delà de beyond uh, its borders, its political borders. And this has nothing to do with what Israel does. Well, now we'll do something that's a, a bit difficult because the hour is late. But uh, we could just take two minutes uh, a break for those who have to leave at this point, and knowing and the others knowing that we will continue for just half an hour. For just half an hour. In the meanwhile, the panel can argue with each other for two minutes if they want to. And, and then we'll now, um, for those uh, who remain, uh, I'd like to give an opportunity for just a few comments, and then I'll ask the uh, members of the panel if they would like to. Can you thank you on the I'm just going to thank you on the phone. Okay, if we could proceed. Is there someone? For those who are in the audience who would like to make a comment. Yes, please. Could you Mark, well take that as a question? Perhaps. Thank <laughs> you. 
cannot allow itself to stay far from it, not to look into its eyes the victimhood of the Israeli people and the way it has been, uh, hopefully been suffering uh, uh, for all of these two years. This is something that the European television don't do. They do they doesn't do that. It can quote it, it can show from far some uh, uh, blood spot, but there is nothing like a very deep, well, look, I, I know where the European television, I mean, uh, you can have a different opinion, this is my point of view, okay? So, uh, uh, that's, that's, that, that's the first point. Second point, the background is completely different. You have to understand it. If you are an Israeli today that goes for a dinner in Rome, and even if you are a Jew, it's just the same. Nobody there will give you, will give you uh, the, 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 this background, that you have been trying to make peace well, bad, uh, with deserving criticism, not deserving criticism, but certainly giving away colonies and territories as much as you could until two years ago. Nobody will give you this credit, you know? Everybody will think that history for you is, has, doesn't have any dynamic. It's a non-dynamic history what is in the eyes of the European. The Israeli are conquerors and colonizers. And, this is in, and they want to keep the colonies. This is what is there in the mind uh, of, the, of the European and nobody. One. Two, Arafat uh, hasn't done what he has done. Now I don't want to elaborate because it's too long. Arafat is not Arafat. Arafat is somebody else. Uh, 
the, the, the Israeli television is completely intrigued, and this is maybe the most important point of all. You can have Carmela Menashe the day after criticizing the behavior of the army and the 1,000 other uh, army uh, journalists that, that will say that, that the operation was not well prepared, there has been too much of a bloodshed, that, that the army has been uh, exaggerated or that didn't behave well. But nobody will think that you went there because you are evil. And this is exactly what is passing in the European mind. You go there because you are evil. If you don't want to, so from this, Babene, from this kind of, of information to the point that the Jews are evil, the steps are just the ones that have been described their sense of guilt, uh, past of colonialism, uh, incapacity of uh, judging the history, the complicated history of the Jews, whatever you might like, you can put it in this bag. But basically, the idea that is now around is evil, evil, evil. This is what Franks were here, and Sharon is the champion of evil in the eyes. So it's not about criticism of Sharon, it's about evil. And certainly the, back, the background of your comments, your comments is not this idea of evil. So you cannot compare, please stop doing that, because this really, not your criticism, creates a problem to the European public opinion, but your uh, putting on the same level your criticism with the European criticism. This creates big problems. I'll try and answer the gentleman's question uh, very briefly. As far as Britain is concerned, uh, people are extremely frightened of the Arabs and are going to become much more frightened. But they blame the Jews for bringing that fear upon them. And I'm afraid that if, heaven forbid, there should be a major terrorist outrage in Britain, I'm afraid the Jews will be blamed, even though it will be carried out by Arabs. The British have absolutely no understanding whatsoever of what we all are up against. They have no context, they have no history, they have no perspective, they have no knowledge. Because in Britain, no one, not even our sainted Prime Minister, who as we all know is President Bush's next battle, not even our sainted Prime Minister is telling them the truth. Could you give to Debbie, please? Just to briefly answer two points. One of uh, one is your point about obsession uh, about Israel. Well, you know this obsession about Israel. Uh, if I go on, you know, recounting my own argument, uh, this obsession with Israel we share with too. You know, in Israel, you know, uh, um, uh, talking about uh, it's a cured radio man. We're talking about television. Uh, a few years ago, you know, one of our our rock channel stopped at all uh, broadcasting foreign songs, only Israeli songs. This is it. No Israel, no, no, no rock, no rock scene, only Israeli scene. We, no we, yes, music. no foreign music. So rock music, I mean, imagine. And, uh, and this is just one, one little side because we are so obsessed with us. That's one thing. Secondly, you know, uh, in famous book in the 80s by Thomas Friedman, a journalist uh, from America, he said that uh, Israel is not a country with a conflict, but a conflict with a country. So he wrote it in, on the 80s, uh, wondering about the obsession uh, about Israel. But I can tell you, I mean, from my own point of view, I see in the story of the conflict all the ingredients of a good story. I mean, you were talking about symbolism, about symbolic. Sure, it's so symbolic. I mean, you know, you couldn't even invent it in your imagination. You know what what is happening in reality here. So I mean, this is really the best story that I can think about uh, in recent years. So no wonder an uh, obsession with Israel is just a sign of a healthy sense of curiosity. I mean, you know, uh, sitting in London or sitting in in, in, in France or whatever. I mean, what should I be interested then, you know, in the politics or what can Livingston do does with traffic in, uh, traffic in central London? Or should I be interested in, uh, in Jacques Chirac's uh, foreign policy uh, maneuvers? I mean, this is the story here. I mean, this is really, it's a religious story, a political story, historical story, media story, cultural story, economic story. I mean, a story of morality, a story of anything, of everything.
civilization, clash of civilization, the frontier and so on and so forth. Of course, it's the best story around. So I don't question what you're saying. I mean, I'm just strengthening. That's one thing. And secondly, to do what Fiona was saying. Of course, European media lack background. Media becomes, as I said, by privatization. In, in your own country, in Italy, it is one very good example when uh, the media, especially the television, got privatized, yes? Part of it, that's right, but it goes more and more in the, in the direction of news without context, news without background, news without analysis. I mean, it goes, uh, the whole world goes to this direction. But let me think, let me still um, hope Yes, that as uh, Yao was saying, that it, it, it is a, a, a question of waves. In the beginning of the 80s, American television went on a very, very hard, brutal commercialization project um, in the news. Hardly any hard stories, good stories, were, were, were broadcast. Two, three years afterwards, CNN was created, broadcasting only news. And, and you know this goes this way and that way. I mean, I think that this kind of thing of waves. I, I hope, of course, I said I hope it will also prevail. So this kind of uh, serious and um, and, and um, superficial journalism is a true representations of the society. It's not more pravda type of television imposed on society from without. It is what society wants. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't really uh, exaggerate so much, you know, in this. Uh, of, although, of course, I share you, uh, I share all the uh, concern that was voiced here about uh, outbursts, and also you was thinking about uh, about uh, the new dangers uh, to European society and culture. Uh, Eliyahu, would you like to have the last word? Yeah. Uh, I think that we are devoting too much attention to the negative in Europe, which I agree with Dudu, are not a crescendo to ad infinitum, but a way. And then the other point we, we should not neglect, and we are, in my opinion, we are neglecting, is the question, why did the liberal Europe go anti-Semitic? Is it all because they did is a, an inheritance from the communists? Or is there a reason? I'm not arguing what the reason is. But I think we should devote much, much more attention to the question why did liberal Europe, which was always or largely pro-Semitic and pro-Zionist. I, I, I want to remind you that the, that the Guardian was the most pro-Zionist paper in Britain. No, but what happened that these media have become anti-Semitic and anti-Israel? Why did these groups become invisible? Well, I think with that question, we'll have to draw to a close. And I want to say thank you very much, most of all, to Jacques for this extraordinary thing. And thank you very much to the members of the panel and to all of you for attending this evening. Bye -bye.